So, do you want to start off? Yeah, I will. So, yeah, good evening, everybody, or good or, or good day, because I think some of you are over the pond. Um, so it's nice to see you. And um, just I'm just going to um, chat about a couple of things that are coming up and things that we've done before Noel introduces this evening. Um, last week, we had our first um, live event at White House Farm, which is the most extraordinary Arboretum in Kent, very close to Item Moat, so close to Tunbridge. And this is the home of Maurice Foster. We had Maurice and his daughter Claire and um, Jack Aldridge on a couple of weeks ago on Thursday Garden Chat. Um, and it was the most extraordinary afternoon. And we have another two seasonal visits um, planned, plus a day on summer pruning with Caroline Jackson, the wonderful Caroline Jackson. Um, so those of you who can make it to um, have a look, have a look on the map where it is. It's very, as I say, it's very close to Tombridge in Kent. It is an extraordinary place. Morris is, is so knowledgeable and everything has been planted from seed or from cuttings. It's a 50 year old arboretum and it's it's absolutely extraordinary. I can't I don't know what else to say, really. But, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a little known place because up until now it's been his private home, his family home. And of course, as Morris is now 89, unbelievably, they're thinking about the future and, and have set up a trust. And so going ahead with uh, visits and events and things is, is part of their going forward. So if anyone has any questions about it, have a look on our diary page. It's the White House, Far White House Farm Arboretum. Um, please do uh, look into it because the place is reasonably limited, but I think everybody who went this month is coming back in the summer for the next visit. Um, Morris has also bred a lot of plants. Um, what the One of the most notable ones is hydrangea hot chocolate, for example. So he's very, very well known. And, um, you know, these people are such extraordinary horticulturalists that, you know, it's lovely to be in their presence. Anyway, um, so other things coming up. Um, we have a, a webinar coming up with the amazing uh, plantsman Cassian Schmidt coming up very soon. Um, and, and then our sort of last webinar of the of the spring season is with Chris Fellhaber at, from Chanticleer and it will be summer at Chanticleer. Um, and then we sort of take a rest on the we take our foot off the pedal of the webinars for a while because the evenings are light and hopefully the weather will sort itself out. and We'll all be busy gardening. That's the idea anyway. If somebody just tell the weatherman. Um, so other live events, do have a look at the our diary on the events page. Um, we have uh, a model making um, workshop with myself at Yo Valley down in Somerset. Wonderful garden, gorgeous place. And then we have a garden and plant photography uh, workshop with Jason Ingram, who is the award winning garden photographer at one of the most extraordinarily beautiful gardens. Um, in in England, actually, Case uh, um, on House. If you go to the um, little, you know, our, our events page, you'll see a web link for Case on Gardens. Just have a look at it. It's also going to be in Gardens Illustrated in the May issue, and I know that because I've written the article. So um, it is very very splendid, and of course, it's it's only um, you know you can only go there if you're doing an event or uh, on an open day. Um, we also have a series of events at, at Surge Hill, which will start in May, which is the um, home of Tom and Sue Stewart Smith. And we're going to be based at the Plant Library, which is this sort of living, wonderful um, archive is probably not quite the right word. Laboratory, I think is the best word, the plant laboratory. And we've got three workshops based there. Now, tickets are going. So if you leave things too late, you might miss out. So just have a look through, um, you know, for the next couple of months and see if there's anything that really strikes you. Um, also in May, in about a month's time, uh, we have our two day event in um, Sardinia with James Hitchmo and Marco Scano. And that's going to be a botanizing trip. One day walking on the coast of northern Sardinia and then one day walking in the hills of northern Sardinia. And I'm really looking forward to that. We had a wonderful time in Sicily with James last spring, and I know that at this point in time, um, Sardinia will be looking beautiful. Um, so that's going to be an exciting trip. Um, and those are those those are the sort of you know the, that's April and May taken care of. But we have lots of things all throughout the whole of the summer going into the autumn. So do try and explore. Um, the uh, events uh, diary and see if there's anything that grabs you. Obviously, Thursday Garden Chat continues throughout the summer months. We do record it. It goes onto our YouTube channel. Um, and so if you can't make it, you can catch up uh, the day after 
um or, or you know on the friday or the saturday so noel tends to put that up after a couple of days um this thursday garden chat is a free um public service broadcast and so if you are in a position to donate anything it does keep the wheels turning at garden masterclass um and everybody who comes and talks and 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 chats to us on a thursday is doing it out of their own time as well so um just to, just to point that out if you're not a member um, you don't have to be a member to enjoy what we do, but if you are a member, there are lots of lovely things that we offer you. Um, discounts on live events, discounts on webinars. Um, we will also be putting on special events, um, special talks, podcasts and things that we will we will highlight in our monthly newsletter. So have a look at the membership if that's something that grabs you. But bear in mind, if you don't have to be a member to enjoy what we do, but there are lots of perks if you do. Um, and I think that's all of the news and views. I'm going to hand back to Noel in his Cerise shirt, looking very smart because <laughs> he's got sunshine in Portugal. That's why he's all dressed up, everybody. <laughs> I've got a Cardi on. He's got his his going out in the sunshine sure. shirt. <laughs> Thank you, Annie. Thank you. Um, so one of the nice things about doing what we do is the opportunity to interview and make recordings with people we've known for a very long time and ask them all the questions we've sort of been storing up all over the, through, through the years. And uh, this evening we are going to a very special area of England in the west of England, the Malvern Hills, which is an area that is quite small, has a very special atmosphere and, uh, and people outside Britain never particularly sort of aware of it. Um, lovely walking country. And another reason for why I've always loved the Malvern Hills is a wonderful uh, nursery, a nursery that's been there for, um, it's now in its third generation, uh, Old Court Nurseries run by the Picton family. And so back in November, I made an interview with Paul Picton uh, about the history of the nursery and his daughter, Helen, who's been running it for the last few years uh, and uh, with her husband Ross Barber and um, it's, um, it's quite a long interview it's I think an hour and seven minutes uh, there's some great stories in there and you get a really good insight into how things were in the nursery business sort of you know half a century ago but also how a business that you know, so many of these little family-run businesses have disappeared. I would say probably 95% of them have disappeared. And it, Old Court Nurseries has been a survivor. Uh, and uh, the um, known primarily for its national collection of, of, of asters, which is one of the reasons why I put this shirt on, actually. <laughs> Aster to, to, to Aster colour. Aster yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it, it's a great recording. Um, uh, as I said, it is a recording. Um, we may well have Paul with us at the end of the session to answer, answer questions. But uh, so this is a recording and with some wonderful images, actually, that uh, Helen sent me uh, la la last week. Uh, so, uh, welcome to Old Court Nurseries in the Malvern Hills uh, in the west of England with Paul Picton and Helen Picton and Ross Barber. So, um, Paul, you uh, first met you when you were running a nursery, which of course was famous for its, for its asters, um, but there's quite a big history there and you took it over from your father uh so if you could perhaps give us the outline of the, the history mm. of, of the nursery well the, the the nursery came about because one of the members of the ballard family who lived in Cornwall and eventually owned most of the farmland of, around Cornwall, mm. and gradually bought up the states um they were descendants of Stephen Ballard, who was a, a great engineer, and um, he um, did a lot of railway work, and he actually was the person who got the first tunnel mm. through the Malvern Hills, mm. so that the railway from Hereford could actually take people direct on to London mm. eventually, mm. which mm. didn't happen before. Yeah, um, the first tunnel, unfortunately had a slight sort of fault in it 
and they decided they couldn't run trains through it, so we had to build another tunnel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that was at the end of his engineering career, yeah. really. The Ballard family were a very large family, of, of all sorts of branches on them. And uh, one of um, Stephen Ballard's sons, called Ernest, who lived at what was then called the court, mm. um, we're talking now about the end of the uh, 19th century, mm. and um, he was a very, very keen naturalist, a botanist, he was a, one of the early photographers, he could paint, he had an interest in all sorts of things. His favourite pastime actually was ice skating. Oh, <laughs> I never, never believe it. But um, anyway, he he had a lovely garden. He had a rock garden which was built by the Ingerson family. Mm -hmm. So it was quite an extensive one. But he was also very interested in all sorts of plants and trees, um, particularly what were known as asters or micamastases at that mm -hmm. time. And uh, he had them growing around his garden and they were seeding themselves, as, as they will. And he looked at these seedings and he could see that quite distinct variations were coming about. Um, and he thought, well, he was quite a religious man and he actually said to his wife, well, if God can do that well, I can do better. <laughs> so he decided he was going to start doing deliberate crosses yes. between his mm. micmastases. Yes. And the sort of micmastases growing were mostly the Novi Balgiae mm. type, mm. 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 Um, which, which heralded from North America. He didn't at that stage grow any of the lovely European asters, mm. the mm. Aster Amelis. And uh, he got lots and lots of seedlings. He had a large vegetable garden attached to the garden at Old Court, as it became known, because somebody else built another house, which they called New Court. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he had, you know, he filled the vegetable garden mm -hmm. with seedling with mistakes. Well, mm. this didn't go down well with the chap who was looking after the vegetables. Mm -hmm. And he said, either the mistakes is go or I go. Mm -hmm. Well, since they actually wanted someone to grow vegetables for them, he, he started looking for a bit of land. Mm. And as luck would have it, a piece of land opposite where he lived came up for sale mm. when the old Barton Court estate had to be sold up. And um, so he managed to buy that mm. at a very reasonable price. It, it had the um, rather unprepossessing name, especially if you're going to grow plants on it, of, of Stony Pleck. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next door to it was even worse, that was Bloody Moor. Oh, dear, dear. <laughs> <laughs> he might have yes. had the best deal. Yes, yes. <laughs> so anyway, the, this land was all ploughed up at the mm. turn of mm. the uh, century, 19th, 20th century. Mm, mm, mm. And um, Plowed, of course, by horse plough. Horse and cart, horse and, and plough, yes, yes. People coming in to break it up and mm. the rest of it. And uh, there his seedling micmastases went. And there was no thought then of it being a commercial enterprise, no, no. but uh, various people uh, in the autumn when the micmastases were flowering mm. would look mm. over the hedge as they walked up the road. And... Um, Eventually they started saying, well, can't I buy some of your mm -hmm. stays, Mr. Ballard? And when it got to 1906, the um, business he was involved in was part of the Ballard enterprise, which was fruit farming mm -hmm. in a very big way, mm -hmm. and producing cider vinegar mm -hmm. in an even bigger way. They won prizes for the quality of their cider vinegar all, mm -hmm. over, mm -hmm. all over the world, literally. And he was had trained as a chemist, yeah, a, yeah. A, not a, a pharmaceutical chemist, mm, mm. but an industrial chemist, yes. and was in charge of the chemical right. processes in mm. making cider vinegar. Um, anyway, so he thought, hmm, well, it might be rather a good idea if we actually did start to sell plants. So mm. in 1906, 
it became Old Court Nurseries. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And um, that, that was where the McMastasy story mm -hmm. really took off. Yes, as far yes. as Cole was concerned, it uh, became the McMastasy centre of the UK, if mm -hmm. not the world, mm -hmm. because he read plants in a big way. And mm -hmm. uh, he not only had his field opposite the house, which was Old Court Nurseries, but he had bought about four or five, or rented some, other fields, yes. and uh, filled them all with Michaelmas seedlings. Mm, mm, so mm. his theory was that you have to grow lots and lots of Michaelmas in the Belgii group in order to get enough variation. Mm, mm. And you simply went through there looking for improvements mm in the form of the flower stem, mm, mm. the form of the flower itself, the colour, getting cleaner colours. Mm, mm. Because back in the at the end of the 19th century, most Michaelmastasias were very tall growing plants, yes. mm, mm. with very soft, gentle colours. Yeah, yeah. If you look at one of the paintings of Gertrude Jekyll's mm, border, mm. which was actually um, probably Edwardian, mm, but it mm. still had these very the tall height. plants yeah, yeah. and mm. very soft colours. Yes. Some of that admittedly might might have been to do very much with Gertrude Ducal, who, who was quite interested in plants, but she was really only interested in what she could do with them in colour schemes, as mm. it were. Because mm. she was fundamentally <laughs> an embroiderer, <laughs> yes, wasn't she? Yes, yes, training. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm. Mm. Yes, I guess. I've just been reading a very interesting book of which talks about the interaction between Gertrude Jekyll and Ellen Wilmot. Uh, it's not uh, Miss Wilmot's Ghosts. Yes. Oh, it's not, yes, I'm it's about three quarters of the way through it. It is a <laughs> wonderful book. It is a wonderful book. Um, and also just the whole... Have you, are you read? Have you read it yet? Not yet. Yeah, not yet. It's yeah. fantastic. And it's also just how the, the, the writer, Sandra Lance, how she came across all of the archives in Specsy yes. Park. Oh, dear. I know. Anyway, I know Specsy. Yes. I say it's a wonderful <laughs> book. Uh, great. Yes, yes. It's yeah. written so well. Yes, yeah. it is. It yeah. is. So, Sorry. OK, so we've got so, uh, basically open, <laughs> yes, open, open breeding. No, no, not we're not doing talking about deliberate crosses yeah. yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, so, OK, we've, so we've got this sort of new race of, of Michaelmas that, on That's on it. It was yeah. very much... Um, he, he, Ernest, did cross... Mm particular mm. plants which yes. he selected yes but uh, this was in his early years of mm, reading mm, when, mm. when it got beyond that yeah. he discovered that this open method actually worked worked better as it were oh, really? apart from a few instances because for some reason completely unknown to me mm. he decided he'd like to have a yellow flowered mcmastasi uh, yes so why anyone would want a yellow flowered <laughs> autumn Asked her when there were so many other wonderful Chrysanthemum, for example. Yes, yes, yes. 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 There's, there's a lot back. of people come Run. asking us for daisies. Can, can you do me an aster that yeah. grows in the shade? And you're thinking, well, why would you do that? Yeah. You're in the sun, <laughs> a shade lover. Yeah. 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 And there's always Eurabia de Varicatus. Yeah. 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 So he's, he's, he spent well, virtually the whole of his plant breeding life trying to cross white. Asters, mm. which are now called Cynthia trichons, mm, incidentally, mm, which you'll come to that yeah. later on. Um, and he crossed them with Solodagos, ah, which, which mm. he did achieve. Yes, hybrid yes. plants. Mm, mm. Uh, at one time they used to be called Solid Asters. Solid Asters. Yeah. Mm. Changes now. Um, and he, he used the dark stemmed Solidago Caesius. Mm, 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 mm. And uh, just before we got to the uh, Second World War, he'd actually got six plants of these hybrid, which, which had more aster in them mm, than Solidago. Mm, so mm, so mm. they looked, and they were sort of, sort of a creamy. Yellow, apparently. yeah, yes, not yes. not very, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. not very probably convincing. dirty white, really. Yes, but yes. <laughs> and anyway, these six plants were growing very happily. But when, but during the Second World War, unfortunately, you, you, you will be aware that the fields were ploughed up yes, for growing yes. potatoes mm, and that mm, sort of mm, thing. Mm, mm. And while he was absent from the nursery one day, the 
chaps came along to play and they played the wrong field. Yeah. And it was the one that had his yellow Mick mistake. Oh dear, <laughs> so we lost and, that one. And to yes. be quite honest, he was never quite the same again no, after dear, all those dear, years of dear, work. That word. Oh, <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, I'm digressing a bit. His Mick Daisy breeding was amazingly successful mm, in mm, the 1920s, mm. 1930s. Yes. Mm, mm. And he bred uh, over 60 varieties. Yeah. Mm, mm. And his thing always was, he said, you've got to keep ahead of yourself with your breeding. He realised what the rose growers had realised. Mm was that you had to produce new varieties which you were going to be selling five, six years. Yes, yes. Hence, this, this year's model. In order yeah. to, mm, mm, yes. Mm. Yes. The older roses. Mm. Were, well, Henry Ford discovered yes. this in car production. Yes, yes. Exactly. This year's model. Yes, yes, yes. 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 So he, he had a very good commercial mind. Right, right. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, which, yeah. which was yeah. quite surprising. Mm, mm, mm. Um, so, uh, but by the time it got to, and he, incidentally, mo a lot of his brands which he bred mm. are named after members of the Ballard family um, and various others, friends and mm -hmm. all this sort of mm -hmm. thing, as, as well as things like strawberries and cream, which obviously weren't named after a person. <laughs> but um, he, he, the... He took them up to the shows in mm. Vincent Square. Mm, mm. He, he never did Chelsea, obviously, because of the season. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he, he got awards. Yeah. He never got a gold medal oh. for a display mm. of Daisy. Oh, right. <laughs> that, 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 and that actually didn't happen until Helen right. put them on display. Congratulations, and Helen. Yeah, yes, yeah, he, yeah, he, yeah. the father and yeah. No, no, no. no. Mm. The RHS did not issue no. gold medals for Mick Mustaises. No, no. <laughs> However, he did get lots of AGMs mm. and that mm. sort of thing. Mm. And uh, this, this was fine. Second World War, of course, labour, because running a nursery especially in those everything yeah. was open ground yes very the only thing growing in pots were alpine plants yes. mm, mm. of which Ernest Ballard did grow a lot he was very very keen on mm, alpines mm. He, he collected abroad as one was able to do certainly in the early early years mm, of his mm. life uh, with his son Philip who, who moved on to Hellebores with his wife later um, and and uh, the one thing that Ernest Ballard had in the way of Alpines during the war, sitting in the nursery, a great long frame full of Raymondas. Oh, yeah. Pink, yeah. white, and wow. blue. Wow, wow. Nice. Yeah. Nowadays, they'd be worth an absolute fortune. Yes. At that time, nobody would buy them. Really? <laughs> dear, dear. dear, dear. <laughs> Absolutely. Extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, but due to the staff shortages in the war, he's got one friend of the family, mm. the lady, who, mm. who helped him out to try and keep the nursery going, but of course the whole thing yeah. got into a terrible state. And as luck would have it, my um, father, who had been working as head gardener mm. to Miss Hopton mm. at Hagley Park, just outside Hereford, oh, yeah. um, and this was after he spent 15 years working for William Robinson mm, at grave mm, time. Mm. And uh, as William Robinson got towards the end of his life, yes. he suggested that my father ought mm, to move mm, on. Mm, and, mm. Uh, and together with Walter Ingberson, yeah. who had his nursery on the grave tie estate, yes, yes. Birch Farm, um, they recommended it to Miss Hopton, yeah. who had been a client mm. of the Ingersons, mm. Mm. because she had one of the biggest rock gardens in yes. the country yes. and was one of the yeah. founding members of the Alpine Garden Society. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he's got a good job there, but it came to an abrupt end just as the war ended and Miss Hopton died. Um, was the family she'd left the uh, estate to didn't didn't mm, want him so, mm. to sell it. so he was busy looking for a new job and um, Walter Ingsman stepped in again because he was a friend of Ernest Ballard's mm. and said well look here this, this job's going at Old Court Nurseries he wants someone to come and manage and mm. uh, my father then had said well 
I've always been in private service. Mm. I don't really fancy the idea of being a nurseryman. Nurserymen were the sort of people that we had gardeners used to despise, really, <laughs> for mm. one thing or another. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> I don't really want to become one. Mm, mm. But um, eventually his arm was twisted by various people and he did, did take the job at Cole. Yeah, yeah. So he arrived there in 1948. Mm, mm. Um, the rest, her um, mother and myself stayed at... Um, artistry for another year I think because there wasn't any accommodation ready mm, but once mm, that was ready we, we moved on as well so so really it's my father Percy Picton who revitalized old court nurseries mm, mm. and uh, got the thing up and running again mm, uh. but everything then in, in the if we get to the early 50s it was still all open ground mm, mm. And even though my father expanded away from Michmastases and alpines into shrubs and trees and perennials and all sorts of things, um, it uh, it still didn't happen with the, you know, it was a totally different mm, mm. type of growing plants, yes, which yes. is almost gone now. Mm, mm, it mm. still exists in tree growing. Yes, yes. But, but that's trees. about mm, it. Mm, mm, and mm. even most of the trees end up in big containers anyway yeah. because it's mm. more convenient. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I, I can remember as a young boy when the um, big lorries came from, I think it was Stoke-on-Trent or mm, somewhere, mm, mm. Um, Wards and people like yeah, Sankeys yeah. Yes. with the clay pots, oh, a great yeah. big flatbed yeah. lorry packed mm. in with straw. Yeah, yeah. And we had to unload all these things. Mm. Of course, the downside with clay pots is you had to wash them in the cold days during the winter as yes, well, yes. <laughs> ready for the next season. Uh, but eventually, of course, um, the whole thing about nurseries mm. changed when the first garden centres mm. arrived and grew plants in tin cans, yeah, yeah. Um, they moved on to polythene bag pots eventually. So we're talking about, what, 1950s, 1960s? This, this is the uh, uh, 50s. 1950s, yes, yeah. yes. Well, 1950s. Well, Wyve, Wyvale were quite a pioneer, weren't they? They were one of yes, the first people, yes, certainly. Yes. Wyvale of, certainly Wyvale of Hereford. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. yes. That, that was run by a very good family at that time mm. called mm. Williamson. Mm. Mm. Uh, and they previously specialised in growing fruit trees, yeah. and and they did roses to mm, the room. Mm, mm. Yes. Uh, still a big enterprise, but so basically your father was yeah. taken over by somebody else. Yeah. So your father's really really very much a, a general nursery. Yes, yes, but of well, which there were of which there are a lot at, at, at all, the time. Mm. Although the Michaelmases during the fifties and sixties were probably at the height of their popularity. Yeah. Yes. Um, but it, and there were quite a lot of other nurseries by that mm. time mm. who were growing Michaelmas days. Yes. A very well known was Ga one was Gay Border Nurseries mm. at Melbourne in Derbyshire. Mm. Um, so there was a lot of competition, really. Yes. There was a lot of competition in bringing in new varieties, mm. Mm. Um, things with bigger flowers. Um, I mean, uh, Thomas Carlyle mm. down in Berkshire. Mm. Um, wonderful herbaceous plant nursery. He he bred lovely Michaelmas daisies too, mm. um, and the, the well, nearly every nursery that grew herbaceous perennials grew a lot of Michaelmas daisies. Yes, yes. Blooms nursery when they really got mm. going mm. at Bresingham, mm. they mm. had fields and fields yeah. Of, yeah. of them, mm. and it was wonderful to go over there and see it. I to think so. Yes, Mrs. Alan yeah. Bloom, yes. who was yes. a lovely man yeah. anyway. Yes. And um, see these fields yeah. of, of various things, irises, mm -hmm. flocks, one yeah. of the most colourful, all field grown there. Mm -hmm. So, yes, yeah. you, you very much grew up then with the business. Was it always, did you always feel that you, you would take over or did you consider other options? Well, I don't think so, really. No, no. I, I was interested in all, all sorts of things yeah. when I, I got to the end of my yeah. grammar school days. Mm. Um, but I... I Gardening was always there. Yes, I yes. was interested in plants. Mm, 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 um, mm. So I did sort of drift into the nursery. And yes, yes. Um, 
So when when, yeah. when did you formally take over? Well, I didn't formally take the business over until the early 1970s. Yeah, yeah. When my right. father was getting mm, older mm, by, mm, by then, mm, obviously. Mm. And as, um, <coughs> Ernest Ballard died in mm. 1952. Yeah. Um, and his widow made an effort at running the business for a few years, mm, but mm. wasn't a success at no, all. No. Um, so eventually she sold the business to my father, but not the land. Mm, mm. And uh, this, uh, and uh, after she died, the land went to her goddaughter, and um, they were fine and very helpful. But they wanted to sell the land for building eventually, oh, as, mm, mm. as happens. And so there was this great thing in the late 60s and early 70s as to, um, you know, where where can we move the nursery business to? Mm -hmm. There are all sorts of things on offer. Of course, it's not very easy to <laughs> uplift a nursery and no, put it no, somewhere else. Not. No, no, uh, So eventually, um, I was able to buy the land Mm. myself mm. Mm. in the, in the seventies, and that that's when I took business over as well. Right, right, yes. Yeah. What, so, what changes did did you make? Well, not a lot to start mm. with, yeah. because my father had built up a great reputation for growing unusual plants. Yes, yes, yes. The Michaelmas daisies were still there, but by the time we got to the seventies, mm. this mm. great interest in mm. them had gone. Yeah. Mm, mm. Uh, as an example, we used to do open days on the weekends. Yeah. And um, in the 50s, the cars were crowded through the nursery, down the road, yeah. as far down the village. You know, people mm. just flocked in. Yes, yes. And it was wonderful. But it, it coincided with the growth of garden centres. Mm. And the fact that people could walk into a garden and centre and buy, you know, whatever. Um, the interest in Michaelmas days is went down like a balloon that had been pricked. Yes, just, yes. Just like and that. I'm sure that also the fungal disease So we were sitting, sitting there on help. Saturday yeah, yeah. playing cards or something, <laughs> waiting for someone to come oh in. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. It was yes, extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. But something had to happen. Yeah. Um, so we we moved on to uh, doing garden design and planting oh, mm, for people, mm, all that sort of thing. Mm, mm. Even garden maintenance, yeah. hedge cutting to keep mm. some of the staff employed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so how many staff did you have well, at that time? Well, at that time. time we only had three. Yeah. Um, before the war, there were seven or eight people employed. Yes, yes. After the war... It went back possibly to five. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it got down to three eventually. Mm, mm, yeah, mm, mm. yeah. So you uh, gradually began to sort of shift the the, the range of, of plants. Well, yes, yeah. the big change really didn't happen until I got married in 1984. Mm. My wife, Marion. And the nursery had been going on in much the same day. Yeah. I had increased the range of herbaceous perennials mm, mm. more than anything else. Um, because her father had got things like hostas and hellebores. Mm. Um, he would made them very popular because he was mm. one of the first people to grow large quantities yes. of them. Yes. Uh, uh. And uh, people definitely came for them. Mm, mm. Uh, so those are, are still going strong. And um, Helen Ballard, who was um, Ernest Ballard's um, daughter-in-law, mm, mm. um, took a shine to Hellebores. Yes, she started yeah. off by growing some of the hybrids, which mm, my father mm, had mm, got. Mm, mm. And um, then they, uh, she and her husband, Philip, went, went abroad into Central Europe and mm, beyond mm. to collect species Hellebores mm, and mm. different variants and... She, she bred a wonderful range of them. Yes, yes. And uh, Philip Ballard himself was very interested in snowdrops. Oh, <laughs> he right. He yeah, lots yeah, of snowdrops. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there. 
Now, where have we got to? Uh, well, you, we, yeah. we, you, you changing the range of plants that oh, yes, were selling in the yes. nursery. Yes. Well, no, it, the, the big change really came when, when my wife came along. She mm. said, well, look here, we're not getting enough money out of this. Yeah. So, <laughs> got to do something about yes. it. Yes, yes. And because it was down to the two of us plus one person mm. helping mm. out at mm. that time. Mm. Um, so... We sort of thought, well, I don't know. And she said, well, I think we want to revamp the Michaelmas Daisies. And I said, oh, who are you going to sell those to then? Mm. Oh, people love them. They're so beautiful and colourful in the autumn and they finish the season off. So we had about 40 varieties of Michaelmas Daisies left on the place mm -hmm. out of several hundred. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So we, the big search began. Where do we oh, find oh, the Michael um, Stays yeah, is from yeah, to yeah. rebuild mm, a mm, collection of them? Mm, mm. Because it was about that time that the what is now called plant heritage, or what might even be called something else now. It was, it's it was the N changes N NCCPG, was it? Yeah, National Council for Conservation of Plants. I think it was NCCPG yes, at that yes, time. Yes. And also another big thing which came along, which was very helpful, was the plant finder. Yes, yes, yes. That was a revolu revolution in British was, gardening, I think. Absolutely, yes. 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 Yeah. So that all helped yeah. us. Yeah. And... Um, but our greatest help in finding Michaelmas Daisies came in two directions, really. One was a chap called Ronald Watts, mm -hmm. who had been a head gardener down in Surrey. And uh, the person he worked for was very fond of Michaelmas Daisies, and he bred Michaelmas Daisies while he worked for this lady. Mm. Um, but they were mostly... Because he was a head gardener and they were very old fashioned in those days still, they were all in the lady's name, not his name. Oh, <laughs> when right. they yeah. went to shows yeah. and oh, got I the see, walks. yes, yes. But when he retired, yeah. he was able to put them in his yeah. own yeah. name. So mm -hmm. you had Ronald Watts and mm -hmm. all sorts mm -hmm. of things mm -hmm. like that. And he very good for all based on Ballard varieties yeah. Yeah. In the initially. Mm. But uh, so that was one source, and he collected up Michaelmas Daisies mm -hmm. from other places. But the big source were, were two ladies just outside. Miss Allen, Allen and, and Miss Hewish. Yes, I did get to meet them just as they were yes, moving Bell out. Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes, well, yes. At, at the time when we got to yeah. know them, they were oh, well yeah. established in mm, mm, Belmont mm. on the Raxall estate. Yes. Mm. And um, Miss Allen was. Had just fallen for Michaelmas Daisies mm. um, during the early years of the Second World War when she'd been visiting somebody in Devizes mm. Mm. and she was wandering around the town and looked over a gate and um, saw all these wonderful purple and pink and white yeah. flowers this in the autumn wasn't and she didn't know what they were. This wasn't the breed of little Carlo, was it? it was, yes. yes. Aha, yes. right, That's yes. Where yeah. little Carlo came yes, from. I know it's devices, yes. Yes. Yeah. Devices, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And little Carlo, of course, is perhaps one of the um, Best known Michaelmas stages. Well, one, of the, one, of the, even, one of the best. One of the best. Who don't yeah. like Michaelmas stages, yeah. they mm -hmm. probably have little Carlo. Yes. I think the sales of Little Carlo were greatly aided by um, um, Donald Chapman, Donald Barnley, who writes in the Financial Times. Robin, oh, well, Robin, Robin Lane Fox. Fox. <laughs> yes. Because he, yes. he came over to visit when ah. we, we'd got the yeah. collection going. Right, right. And, and um, he saw Little Carlo and mm. took it home and planted it. I and see. And then... Took photographs. But unfortunately, of course, Blue Little Carlo printed on pink financial times. <laughs> it isn't quite the same, <laughs> no. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. It was good publicity. Yes, yes. And this was the big thing. We we, we got the the Miss Allen initially had the first mm. national collection of yeah. Stasis. Uh but she was getting quite old actually by the time we, mm. we mm -hmm. knew her and she wanted somebody else to take them on. Yeah, yeah. So we said, well, we're trying to build up a collection. And, oh, right. and we hadn't thought of going beyond the commercial aspect of it, really. Mm, mm, mm. But uh, So we did decide to take the others on, which meant that we would collect anything which was appropriate. Yes. And uh, was an autumn flowering aster mm, of mm, some mm, description. Mm, mm. 
So that's what moved us into the Astrometis group yeah. and the Fricartii group and all the rest. All the rest, and yes. All the ones which are still true Astors, mm, mm. as they all were at that time, yes. of course. There was no fussing about with names like Symphony Trichon, and that yes, came yes. much later. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and the whole thing absolutely took off. Um, and I think it took off, there was Robin Lane Fox on mm. that aspect, but Clive Nichols, who oh, yes. was young then, yes. we all were, <laughs> um, came along. He, li he lived in Worcester at that time. Oh, did he? Yeah, yeah. And he came along and photographed the garden and mm. got it into country life. Uh -huh. yes. And thereupon people flooded in. Yeah. And amazing, you, you won't believe it really, but it's true. The Daily Mirror, the Daily Mail, the Daily Telegraph, you name it. They wanted to photograph Michaelmas Daisies to make a feature for the autumn. Mm -hmm. Every glossy magazine in the country wanted to photograph I mean, you did Michaelmas. have them very well displayed, I think. Well, That's probably think part that... of the story, isn't it? It's not just the plants themselves, but you know, you, that, that, uh, that, well, gradually, that great border was, was pretty spectacular. Yes, well, gradually, you see, we, the uh, Michaelmas Daisy border had got down to about these 40-odd varieties yeah, in yeah. one curved border, mm, mm, mm. Um, which was in something which was called the Picton Garden. And the Picton Garden arose in the 1970s, um, really, as stock beds for all the interesting plants my father was growing. I see, yes. There was yeah. a great big bed of Daphnes, for yeah, example, yeah. Which, which, you know, he, he, he was a very, very skilled propagator and he yes. could make Daphnes grow like weeds. Someone <laughs> once said he could make a billiard ball grow if he put it in the soil, <laughs> <laughs> which was very apt because yeah. he was a very good billiards player. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so this garden actually in a small way yes. initially, mm. um, and it only really came about because of the change from growing plants open ground mm, to mm. growing them in containers yeah, yeah, yeah. because much less open ground was needed yes, yes. and otherwise we'd use them sort of bays of herbaceous plants mm, and mm, mm. bays of young shrubs growing right, on and all yeah, that yeah, sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. So eventually we had this bit of garden and uh, when we got into the 80s we in, increased the size of the garden my father died in 1984, mm, mm. and uh, at that time we, we um, changed, well, about a year after, we changed the name to the Picton Garden in, mm. as a memorial right. to, mm. to him. Yeah, yeah. It wouldn't have been there if he hadn't been growing all no. these plants. Mm, mm. But, but time was limited, with just mm. my wife and myself and a little bit of help. Yeah. So probably the garden wasn't as good as it could have been, yeah, but certainly yeah. not as good as it is now, with mm -hmm. Ross and Ellen in charge. But we did have this great big curved border yes, of Michaelmas yeah. Daisies, mm. um, and we called it the Jubilee border, actually, because it was at its height with one of the Queen, late Queen's Jubilees. Yes. I just forget which one it was now, but mm -hmm. it could have been the silver one. Um, and that, that appeared on all sorts of pictures all over yes, the place, yes. and it did display the hybrid Michaelmas very well. Mm, mm, mm. Um, but the straight species and so on, we mixed with other plants yes. throughout the garden, because they're very good mixers. Yes, yes. Mm. Mm. And of course, don't look so good kind of en masse, because you don't yes, have the same well, sort of flower it's, power. it's the yeah. big impact, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yes. And uh, you, you could, in, in, in the well, certainly in the 70s or 80s, there probably weren't so many. But as an example, at one time, the Salmon Garden had a great big curve. Oh, really? There's yeah, yeah, stages, yeah. But that was in the early 70s, I yeah, think, yeah. a long time back. Yeah. I think it's now full of Hemeropolis or something yes. like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably doesn't exist now, actually, because they've made big changes there. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's fascinating. And the people who came were w wonderful. Um, um, uh, certainly when they came to visit my father, um, as mentioned, the Savile Garden, Sir mm. Eric Savile mm, mm. became owner yeah, of John yeah. Bond. And, yeah. and he actually gave me 
a little plant, a sort of stick. Mm. It was a magnolia. And he said, well, this is Magnolia dorsoniana. And um, you'll probably see it flower, but your father won't. <laughs> 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 Which was quite honest. Yes, yes. And true. So, but yes. Magnolia dorsoniana, dorsoniana was now a tremendous centerpiece. Yes. In the garden. Mm, mm, I think I and remember it. In, yeah. in the spring, yeah. the yeah. buses sort of slow down so yes. the people can Gosh, see wow. it properly yeah. over yeah. the edge. Yes. <laughs> and so, so, so really, the, the, the wider range of, of species began to then take over from the traditional Mecca mistakes. Well, which, it, it, which it, had it, their Which had their disadvantages, didn't it, they? Yes, it took, took over in terms of quantity of yes, stock, I yes. suppose, really. Mm, yes. Mm. Yes. Well, Mecca mistakes, any plant. <clears throat> that's been intensively bred will have problems eventually, mm, mm. I think. Uh, the same goes for agricultural crops, really, doesn't it? Mm, can do, unless you're, bre yes, unless you're consciously exactly, breeding yes, in disease yes, resistance that's, that's or something. It. Yes, yes, yes. 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 But uh, I mean, other forms, the, the, most of the Mycomastases are based on Astronovi. Algae, mm, Symphiotrichum, mm. yeah. no, Algae, as it is now. Uh, you have the New England Mycomastasis, yes, which, which Symphiotrichum, um, Nova Angli, mm, mm. they have their own problems. Mm. Well, <laughs> fewer, fewer of them, in my experience, yes, yes. And, and 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 indeed many others. But yes, I think one yes. of the but then you come yeah. to the true asters, which yeah. are stood around the Amelis and yeah, the Cartii, yeah. which mm. have very few problems. Uh, we were we were uh, we were we were hearing about the bamboo last night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was this lovely man whose name I've forgotten. He lived at Wigmore. Yeah. And he grew bamboos in quantity. Mm, mm, Just forgotten mm. his name. Oh, it's a job lot, was it? <laughs> uh, no, I wish it was. They were very expensive. Mm. But uh, no, well, with the with the garden, we we had developed the far end of the very very southern end of the mm. nursery. It all had been a, at one time was lovely. We had an old rose garden planted there, and uh, it was in a triangular corner. Mm, mm, mm. And in amongst the roses, I'd always liked a combination, which I'd seen somewhere, and I just at the moment can't remember where, of the Astra Medicine Carti mixed with roses. Mm, mm, wonderful mm, way mm, to grow them. So that's what we did yeah, down yeah, there. Yeah. It was a patch of light soil, because way back when my father started to work in the nursery in the 50s, um, mm. it, it actually had two or three enormous elm trees on mm, it mm, mm. and that's what it was mm. but uh, they died so vast expense they had to come out mm. and um, there were these tremendous holes there mm. where these trees had been excavated from um, it was quite fun actually excavating them because they had something called a, a gun which wasn't a gun at all, it was a tubular piece of metal which you drove into a log of wood mm, mm. and you filled it with, with dynamite. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, and one of you was supposed to know better than all the others, cut a fuse of the right legs, lit it, yes, and, and retreat it rapidly. Back. Dear, dear. <laughs> Those were the days. And we used to go and stand behind the other trees. Yes. Yeah. And then there was this enormous explosion where yeah. the logs went 20 feet up into yeah, the air yeah, yeah, and yeah. landed where, where they would, yes. often yeah. on the road. Yes. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> what I need for the bamboo. <laughs> 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 but anyway, this, this far end, yeah. uh, then we, we, we actually, in those days, you were allowed to do it. We had topsoil from a local sand pit. Mm -hmm. So it's very light soil. Yes. And it suited the Astromelis, and the yeah, roses yeah. weren't quite so happy, yeah, but they yeah, did yeah, did manage. Yeah. So that's what happened down there. So we had that far end planted like that. Now, um, higher, just a little bit north of those, what was down there initially were long bays, beds full of young shrubs yeah. growing on. Mm -hmm. Well, when that changed because of the pot growing, that gradually, some of the shrubs 
which were there then as mm. young plants, are now still there in spite of Ross's best efforts to get rid of them. <laughs> yeah. And um, there's, a, there's a silver birch, which was there. There's a parotia, which... <laughs> all sorts of things like that. Mm, mm. And, and they were just, just out of the rows of seedlings. Yes, yes. But it turned, by design eventually, into a little bit of woodland garden. Mm, mm. We planted Japanese maples, which we initially got from Chris Patterson. Yeah and uh, afterwards got from Ed Smith um, at uh, Creedale Nursery. Was it Creedale? Yes. Yeah. And uh, so we, we ended up with this nice little bit of woodland garden mm, mm. with autumn colour yes, with the maples, yes. you see. Mm. And then we underplanted with ferns. We've got a, a chain fern, which I was absolutely amazed that it didn't grow there, but it did. Mm. And then we... Because the road got busier and busier each year, the main road, which ran across the complete side of the nursery, we thought, well, the noise in the autumn, we hadn't really thought about it much, but we had to think about it eventually because we had lots of occasions when the TV people came to film and mm -hmm. talk, and they complained bitterly about the traffic noise. They said, well, we've got to go away from this, we can't interview oh, them. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I thought, well, what works as a sort of noise break? I know, bamboo. So <laughs> we, we bought lots of lovely bamboos. Yes. Um, fortunately, Ross has left one or two of the nice ones, but most of them he's hired diggers and got rid of. Yes, yes. <laughs> <Which> <laughs> the most enormous thing. bamboo yeah. bonfires. Yeah. Quite <laughs> exciting because it's like firework night, they um, all explode. Yes, I think that's the origin <laughs> of this Chinese love of fireworks. Yes, actually. that's it's, right. It's yes, yes, bamboo. Yes, 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 yes. But, uh, but while they were younger, they worked very well. It did yes, make yes. A, a spin mm. some, mm. some traffic. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Not, not that much. Mm. But they looked nice. Yeah. And the biggest problem is trying to remember the names and somebody yes. asked what they were. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but so, so, and then the other end of the garden, the open bit where the most sun was, uh, I'd planted a curved purple beet hedge. And so on the sort of, it was actually on the northeast side of that, we had the more open space, which oh. was where the herbaceous perennials yeah. and the micum stages yes. would grow. Yeah. 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 And then the lower part we kept sort of shrubby yeah. and trees. Yes. And and that aspect has worked marvellously today because of Helen and Ross's interest in snowdrops and ferns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. yeah. So they, you know, the canopy yes, is, is there. Is aware. Yeah, yeah. 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 And it, the great thing is it takes a long time to grow because a lot of the stuff there, we I'd grown, mm. for, for example, there's a Davidia and Volucrata, mm. which I grew from seed oh, wow. when, I was, yeah. a, when yeah. I was a teenager. Yes, yes. Uh, and various other things mm. Mm. Uh, grown from seed yeah. because it was fun. Yeah. There was a man you might have heard of um, or come across called Cliff Lewis. No. Well, he worked, it was a wonderful thing, in the 50s and 60s. Mm. Um, he worked for Worcestershire County Council, as it was then, mm. in the education department. And he, he worked from a place called Oakfield, mm. just outside the city of Worcester. Yeah. And they trained school teachers at the primary, secondary schools on how to teach horticulture and gardening. Oh, wonderful. Oh, God. Yeah. And so this yeah. they go to... Oakfield and, yeah. then, and they also had a nursery at Oakfield mm -hmm. where they took on a handful of trainees yeah, yeah. Um, young people yes. um, you know, like myself who was left school mm -hmm. and um, taught them how to propagate plants the one thing I remember mm -hmm. which was quite a bit they had the most enormous bed of plants which could be grown from layers yeah, yeah. Right. Which was the thing yes. with, with, you know, until we got on to mispropagation yes, or what have yes, you. Yes. 
Uh, so it was a marvellous thing. So this was all a, a, a Worcestershire County this Council? This was all Worcestershire Fantastic. County Council. Right. They worked yes. closely with Pershaw College, ah, yeah. as you might imagine. Of course, yes. Uh, it's the most marvellous thing. Yeah, um, but unfortunately, in their wisdom, Worcestershire County Council decided to spend it, the money on gypsy encampments or something like that and yeah. closed Oakfield. Yeah, and yeah, well, that was the end of that. Yes, local government's always on the... But this chap, Cliff Lewis, who ran it, was wonderful. And he worked as an advisor for the BBC on Percy Thrower's gardening programme in the days when it was monochrome. Right, yes, yes. And he persuaded my father to go on. Yeah. So we went to Percy Thrower and Mm -hmm. we examined his greenhouse without any glass in it and all that sort of thing when it was still in monochrome. (laughs) And we had a wonderful time up there. we took Michaelmas Daisies up to make a little border of Michaelmas Daisies. And um, my father, in those days, they didn't have the modern recording facilities. Mm. The actual, they rehearsed and the programme actually went out live. Yeah, yes. There was no, so what was no, said was said. No, 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 so no, they rehearsed yeah. this, going down this yeah. little border of Michaelmas Daisies. Yeah. My father and Percy, the two Percy's, of course, yeah, there's yeah. Percy this and Percy yeah, yeah. that, and the other yeah. got mixed up as to which one, you know. And um, um, in the Michaelmas Daisy border, we put Percy Thrower, mm, which mm. was being raised by Gable for the nurseries, a lovely blue Michaelmas mm. Daisy. And Percy Thrower being Percy Thrower, when it came to the border, he said, Oh, look at this marvellous blue Michaelmas Daisy, Percy, what's it called? And my father said, Well, you know very well what it's called. It's called Percy Thrower. <laughs> so that they rehearsed that twice and then they did the live thing and they got to this again and Percy Thrower said, oh look at this wonderful Michaelmas Daisy, what's it called Percy? And the father said, well it's, it's named after you, isn't it? Percy Thrower, but it is a better, it is a Pity they didn't find a better plant. <laughs> <laughs> so that's up right now live. <laughs> but in spite of that, they got on very well. Yeah. <laughs> great. Good, great. Okay. Um, so um, we got right off the topic there. Yes, yeah, so I think. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's get. So. Helen, you obviously grew up on the on the you know as a nursery girl. I imagine you probably played with the with the plants and yeah, um, not just played with the plants. I was pretty much well. Mum decided that a playpen was a bit unnecessary, so yes. she literally just put us on the potting bench yeah. when we were little in a pile of compost. I yes. mean, I don't know what I ate, but <laughs> <laughs> seemed to have done all right on it. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> didn't kill me, so it must yeah. have been all right. Yeah, yeah. yeah I spent uh, all my childhood messing about with yes. the plants mm. on the compost heap. Yeah, we were. Um, always told that we had no money and couldn't afford anything. <laughs> so whatever I wanted to do, it was like, no, we can't yeah. afford it. You'll yeah. have to think of something else. Yeah. So I used to spend most of my time trying to um, help with the family yes. income, yeah. Yeah. which was often not popular. Um, Favourite yeah. pastime of digging plants off the compost heap because they looked perfectly good. Yes. Why were they on the compost yes. heap? Yes, yes, they'd be take, potted up, yeah. nice label put in. Yeah, yes. take them off the compost heap, then sell raffle yeah. tickets yeah. for people to win them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very enterprising. Yeah, I yes. got in a lot of trouble for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But no, plants were always yeah. part yeah. of what I was brought up with. Yes, yes. So it was it just felt completely natural to take over the business? Or? Uh, well, no. no. I'd yeah. um, gone through various things as yeah. all teenagers do. I yeah. thought for a while I'd do physiotherapy. Right. Then I decided yeah. I didn't like people enough. <laughs> 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 um, then thought herbal medicine. So I was gradually yeah. working my way no, back really. into the plant yeah. regime yes. and yeah. eventually yeah. ended up um, doing botany. Yes. So yeah. not horticulture and I didn't really all through my um, years at university Mm -hmm. and I did a year of industry at Kew as well I was very much sticking to going to go down the line of doing something academic in botany oh really yeah Mm -hmm. but always with the interest of the nursery in sort of the back of my head and then it got to the stage where you have to make a decision (laughs) as Mm -hmm. to what you're going to do and it was also coinciding with the time that um, mum and dad were trying to wind the nursery down and yeah. dad was thinking of retiring and I thought, no, I can't stand it. I've got to go back and <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. yeah. Yeah. take it on. My yes. brother had no interest in no, it, so no. there wasn't any sort of competition in that no, department. No. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I 
announced as I was leaving university, I'm coming back. <laughs> yes. Oh. So your parents yeah. must have been glad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope they yeah. were. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but, uh, so, I mean, you must have had, you know, from the word go, decisions that you wanted to make in, in terms of changing things. Um, what, were your, what were your priorities? Yeah, I mean, the first, uh, when I first came back, one of the first changes that um, I did, with the help of mum, actually, was mm-hmm. to get back to doing the Morven Autumn show. Right. Mm. Which Dad had done before, mm, mm, mm. and then it had to give up because it's well time yeah, consuming yeah, and yes, yes. <laughs> very. Yeah, we, we should just say that the Malvern Showground is one of these, you know, typically English uh, country showgrounds, yeah. and the Spring Malvern Show, which eventually the RHS took over, mm-hmm. and they took over the Autumn Show as well. I mean, everyone always had a really good. Certainly, the Spring Show always had a really good reputation because it was far less crowded than Chelsea, and you didn't have to go out to London. And you had so many; a lot of the best of Chelsea was was there, wasn't it? And, yes. and the Autumn Show was a was a really good one at a time of year when you should be thinking about planting up anyway. Yeah, yeah. and it's, um, I mean, it still is. It's yeah. um, it's a lovely little show, yes. but, and so handy for us, of course. Yeah. yeah. So that was before I'd even finished university. Yeah. Um, Mum and. I had discussed it and she'd started potting right. up all the stuff ready yeah, for the yeah, show. So, yeah. yeah, it was a bit of a launch straight into the deep end for that. Yes, but yes. Um, that was one of the first things to start getting the publicity up and running mm-hmm. again and um, start turning things back round. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously moving more into things with... Um, Increasing the website, yes, that had been pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> we yeah. had we had a good website up and running, but mm. to do online sales as yeah, well, yeah. so improving mail order, um, yeah, lots of decisions yeah. had to be made. But it was a difficult learning process or a steep learning curve, yeah. I should mm, say, because mm, mm. uh, not only was it the nursery but also the garden. Yes, and there was. Um, I mean, Dad was when I first came back still um, doing a lot of well, pretty much doing all the garden actually, mm, mm, mm. Um, and a lot of. So I spent a few years just learning the way he was doing it. Yeah. So we were still on double digging the Novi Biology beds every oh year. Oh yes. <laughs> Victorian. Yes. 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 Yeah. <laughs> um, lots of plants and mulching and stuff like that. And yeah. Getting to grips with it, but um, yeah, gradually I started introducing more changes and mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, in terms of the, the range of plants that you were interested in that you felt were commercially more viable, I mean, how, how was that changing? When I first started, there wasn't a huge amount of this. Yeah. I was actively encouraged that alpines would be a good idea. Right, yes, <laughs> yes. So we did try that for a brief spell yeah, of time, yeah. but um, the viability of that, I mean... Yeah. A plant that takes so long to grow to a nice saleable plant, mm-hmm. and you're going to be selling it for three pounds. Yes, <laughs> I mean, Alpine, uh... <laughs> the, the, the decline of the English rock garden has been a sort of s- one of the stories of the 20th yeah. century, really, wasn't it? And Definitely. That's, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, we did venture down that line mm-hmm. for a little bit, mm-hmm. and we tried various other things, but really, initially, mm-hmm. until I met Ross, we were very much just trying to keep the nursery on a um, level yeah yeah keel gets um the publicity up and running again again mm, mm. you know keep the people coming in yeah, yeah. um so we were sticking very much to the daisies mm, at the time mm, mm. Uh, increasing mail order was one of the big things that we were yeah. pushing there because that's yes an important part of the business so mm, mm. Yeah. And of course, with the internet, uh, the internet sales really have, have revived mail order to an incredible extent. And yeah. I remember, you know, back in the, I suppose, around about 1990, people were saying, oh, mail order is dead, mail order is dead. And I, I just kind of knew it wouldn't be. And then, <laughs> then along came the World Wide Web, which, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, when did you meet Ross? So we met in 2010. So actually, only I'd only been back at the nursery for a year. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he turned up on a visit, didn't you? Works day out. Yeah, works day out. Yeah. Um, and then was looking for advice on um, asters, to, yeah. of course, <laughs> to go does. in the rose garden at yeah. where he was working at the time. Yeah. yeah. And so I went and I yeah. took Dad with me. Yes. Um, and we went across and we went and looked around the garden mm. and advised on asters and it was all downhill slope from there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, 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 yes. Um, so uh, we'll talk to Ross in a minute. But, yeah. but yeah. So, so in terms of those traditional Michaelmas varieties, I mean, did you? I mean, they, they, let's face it, they are quite hard work and there's all these disease issues. And I'm, in fact, one of my first garden memories was of my father's presumably complaining about the mildew on the, on the wake <laughs> of the stasis. And I sort of remember very clearly where they were in the in the garden. Um, so and, it, and that's something you, you have done. It's very much major on all these other aster varieties you know, that, that are simply much healthier and easier. Uh, yes, although we still do... Um, mm. Well, we obviously still have the national collection. Yes, um, yes. Um, the New York the Nova Barges mm. are still hugely popular. Yeah, yes. That's a good reason. I mean, the flowers oh, are yeah. wonderful. Yes, and they're much less maintenance plants, aren't they? Yeah, yes. but we have, um, we do still concentrate mm. a yeah. lot, but mm. more and more at the moment with the small flower varieties, yes. which tend to have much better disease resistance as yeah. well, but mm. they're mm. becoming more and more popular. Yeah. I think it's... Yeah easier maybe to use them in mixed borders and things yes. like that and mm, people mm. can really see the appeal with them yes it also yeah. helps the mm. favorites of mine so yes yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, also i think all this this american interest in their native plant mm. flora has made us much more aware of those and, and uh, not that necessarily all those north american asters are successful i remember we had that conversation on the phone fairly recently yeah. where saying various things that that the Americans seem to regard as perfectly normal garden plants don't really flourish here no 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 yeah, I think I think I said it at the time. We're yeah. so much more of an island for yeah. well, mm. Western Atlantic coast, yes, I suppose. Yes. It just isn't the same as North American continental. Mm. It's, mm. Uh, mm. <laughs> but there we go. Yeah. Yeah. We can't grow everything. No, no. <laughs> Try as we might. Yes. So, uh, what are the other um, other perennials that you've you've really majored on? Um, so all of the autumn flowering ones we've yes. kept uh, yes. going with yeah. the big groups with the Rebecca's and Heleniums yeah. and mm. things. Mm. Uh, we're actually now, but then again, this is part of what Ross and I have been doing, yeah, but we've yeah. um, started looking a lot more at Heleniums mm, and mm. Um, things like that. So, yeah. Yeah, yes. <laughs> that's the latest one. Yes, yes, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and it is, I mean, part of the story is what we've done, because I was a bit stuck. I was had I been left to my own devices yeah. on taking on the nursery, I yeah. would have been very stuck because Dad was obviously doing less and less. Yeah. Mum does a lot of the propagation and mm. potting up, which mm. was fine. That then left me doing all of the garden and it yeah. was just not going... It was okay. I don't know how long I could have managed to have kept no, it going no, just on yes. my own. Yes, I think yes. it would have been a and, serious and, and the garden struggle. is an important part of the business, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Without the garden, I don't think we'd have the people no. visiting. Yes, um, yes. And then, of course, without the visitors, you don't sell the plants. No. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> it yeah. um, mm -hmm. very much goes hand in hand. Yes. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was going to be difficult. Mm. I could even tell at the time that it was going to be, um, yeah, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. I was going to have to think of something yes. pretty radical yes. if then, I was going to keep Then going. fortunately met this chap who yeah. was a gardener, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Ross, perhaps could you... So, Ross, what's your, what are your horticultural passions? I just like to be in the garden and, and pottering around in the garden, digging stuff up and replanting it and, mm -hmm. and trying to create something, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that's my best. Yes. What I look forward to doing, but if I've got time to do that, there's obviously all the chores around it. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so you were working as a as a garden management. Yeah, as head gardener at a big estate yeah. over by Stratford upon Avon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we were doing a big project. Yes. And, and went over to Helen, but we we'd done sort of we'd done winter garden, so I was getting in, starting to get into snowdrops. Yeah. A few years before meeting Helen. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, yeah, and just just. It was a bit of a blank canvas over there, so mm -hmm. it gave me the chance to, to start sort of being quite creative. Yeah. And, and when you start to have the opportunity to, to do plantings and mm -hmm. create gardens, then you get deeper and deeper into to different plants. Mm. And you're particularly fond of woodlanders, aren't you? Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's, it's a nice place to be. You know, as I say, I like being in the garden, and that's one of the favourite places to be is down in, in mm. that part of the Picton Garden because yes. it's, it's just very calming and, and really nice. Yes, yes. And you were, you, were, you were lucky in that you inherited, okay, we know about the bamboos, but we, you, you inherited some wonderful canopy. Yeah. You, you inhabit, you, you know, a great, a great habitat, which probably needed planting up. Yeah, 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 we've done a lot underneath it. Yes. Getting plants underneath it and, mm. and we're continuing. 
continually yeah. looking at that and assessing yeah. that and yeah. pulling it apart and putting yeah. it back together. Well, a lot of rearranging as well because yeah. the canopy yeah. Dad had planted yes. quite intensely, so yeah. we've had to move it out yeah. and alter things and parts mm. and whatever. But yeah. um, so there's a little bit of land that you can move quite large acres yeah. yes. at the end of winter quite, yeah, right. quite successfully. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> You're very relatively shallow rooted then. Yeah, yeah right. Yes. Yeah. Whereas when when you pull one out and, yeah. and uh, you got it up. And then just everything drops off. It. All the soil drops off. It. You think, oops. Yeah. <laughs> but you move it and trim it up, and then it, yeah. and it gets away again. Yeah, and bother it at all. Yes. Mm, yeah, mm, yeah. Mm, mm. So we've done quite a bit of rearranging. Yeah. yeah. But we've been very lucky in so much as uh, well. Mum still comes and helps at the yeah. nursery a yes. lot. Yes. <laughs> yes. So most of the cutting's are all done by yeah. mum. Yeah. We, yeah. me and mum, do the propagation together. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, it initially, I suppose, when we first got together, it started very much that we were sharing. All the jobs right the way across because um, you were still learning and getting to grips with the change from being in private employed yes. to yes. nursery with like the garden on the side yeah <laughs> yeah a little bit like granddad so that was quite an interesting mm -hmm. way but dad has always been very good because he's always been there to offer advice but at yeah. the same time he has never been well, you can't do that because I wouldn't have done it like that or anything like that. Oh, that's good. Been, that's good. Yeah, that's yeah. one of the things you inevitably wonder about with generational changes. Is, is, is sometimes it's difficult for the older generation to kind of take a back, back you, seat. Well, you yeah. often hear if you talk yeah. to people who've yeah. taken on family business, oh, it's such a nightmare because they won't let me do <laughs> yeah, anything yeah, that yeah. I want to, but it's never been that No, that's case. great. That's so, good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we still check in. Most of the time. <laughs> Some of the bamboos have just gone yes. <laughs> without checking, but most of the time yeah, we try yeah, and you yeah, know, yeah, go back yeah, and yeah, get yeah, the background yes, or whatever, yeah. if it's something major. Yes, yeah. um, we stripped back the garden quite hard. We've done all, almost the same with the nursery. Stripped it back and started again with a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. We so have tried a few different things, like the alpines and yeah. um, mm -hmm. other bulbs we tried, um, and we just gosh after 10 years or so we're really just starting to find firm footing yeah. with the garden I think because well, it's starting to come back the biggest change and the biggest thing we felt we needed to do was to extend the season mm. because it was very much eggs all in one basket yes, so yes, it was yes. autumn if you had a terrible autumn everything was you had just, a terrible year yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> written off we were only open from July to so the garden yes the garden yeah, was only yeah, from yeah. July to the end of October which was very short mm. so so one of the first things I used to come across when I first started coming to see Helen on a more personal level <laughs> was bring our snowdrops. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, which are, some are still getting quite big clumps in the yeah. garden. The first original ones are brought. So are you, are you trying to do more spring, more of this spring woodland stuff then? As a, it's yeah. gone all yeah. right out that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's good. Yeah, it makes in, sense, um, doesn't it? February with yeah. great display. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, and I, I gather at one stage you went over to, to Latvia to work with uh, Janis Ruxan. I spent a good, nearly a fortnight with, with really? Janis. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, midsummer, so he was yeah. doing all his repotting, so yeah. repotting tulips and all his yeah. crocuses and, yes. and alliums and things like that. Yeah, that must have been a great learning experience. It was. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And just just standing, working away next to him, and listening yeah. to his stories all day long. Yes, yeah, yes. Super. Yeah, no, he's an extraordinary yeah. character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. but. It, that was one of the things I was really keen on, that's why I went, was to learn more about pro uh, how to grow these unusual bulbs. Yeah. Mm, mm. And what I came back with was, after about six months, was that that wasn't the way to go. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so I decided yeah. that wasn't just enough. Too that, much, yeah. yeah, it's just too, just too, too much work for, yes. Yeah, mm, for mm. not, a, a slightly, a bit like the Alpines, I think, mm, you know. Mm, uh, mm. So, so, yeah, that, that, that went to the, to the buy. Yeah, we still yeah. grow. Most of it went into the garden, and it did. Yeah. It either did or it didn't. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what? What are the spring? Apart from the snowdrops, what are the spring genera you're really focusing on, kind of commercially? Commercially. Uh, commercially, the snowdrops are the major yeah. one. Yeah. Are they? Are they? We yeah. are now. Um, well, the ferns. It's going to be poly polypodiums will be commercial. Yeah. You, yes, yeah. yes, yes. We've now got the national collection of those. Right. And there, there was a nice collection already with what Paul had. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I was just looking at some wonderful polypodiums yesterday with uh, John John Massey. I mean, mm -hmm. he's got them coming up through uh, Sikkim and Heterofolium. And uh, you know, it's such a tough plant, that yeah. polypodium yeah. bulgari, you know, being an epiphyte. It'll, and still looking yeah. good yes. and fresh in, in, in yes. the new year as well. Yeah, so, yeah. well, yes. that's part of it. It mm. sits very well yeah. with the early spring. Yeah. Yes. Bulbs, yeah, um, yeah. to work with those and then yeah. the other ferns as well because yeah. the woodland planting when we are 
now getting a little more reputation for the fact yeah. that the garden has got this lovely woodland yes, area yes. that you can come and look at the weird and unusual yeah. stuff yeah, that grows yeah. underneath it. So yeah, yeah. we will, that is our next stage probably. Yes, yeah. So we, expand. we, we yeah. display yeah. the snowdrops similar way to we dis display the daisies yeah. to, to sell. So right. mm -hmm. it's combination planting. So we plant the snowdrops with, with crocuses like the Tommies yeah. and all the early yeah. species yeah. and then they're in amongst the polypodiums mm, mm, mm. Um, and they start in January and get yeah. thicker and thicker right yeah. up until sort of end of March into mm. April don't they? Mm. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's setting them off with other yeah. other plants, yes. pulmonarias, getting them into the borders and yeah. using the using the herbaceous borders yes. as a woodland garden as well mm. so mm. under planting a lot of the herbaceous yeah. with snowdrops, yeah. species tulips mm. and mm. primulas, um, short carexes yeah, yeah, and, yeah, but one of the things we've always felt with them as well was that we didn't want to necessarily go down the collector's route. No, right. So yeah. although there's big pennies in the, you know, yes, you can yeah. get the rarest bulb yeah. or whatever, we wanted something that was going to be longer term and more accessible to the general public mm -hmm. in the hope that, and I think it yeah, is, that yeah. people are becoming more interested in yes. their winter gardens yeah. and the plants and bulbs that yeah. go with it. Yes. So we've always been very keen on making sure we've got a good collection of the older varieties, yes. the really good garden doers. Mm, mm. And yeah, okay, we love them, so we yeah. also have some of the rarities yes, going on. Yes. But realistically, we wanted that yeah. core to yeah. make it more accessible mm. price-wise yeah. and just to say, yeah, this you can put it in your garden, it's going to grow. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's not some miffy thing that's... Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's been really important, hasn't it? Yes, yeah.